All right, I think we'll get started now. Um, our uh, speaker tonight, or speakers, we have with us Ann Tucker Roberts, who is the author of two books, the one we'll be discussing tonight, Across the Spectrum, Mothers of Autistic Children Speak. And we also have Danielle Graziano, um, who uh, wrote one of the chapters in the book and, and is a mother of uh, two children with autism. Um, Anne is there, they both live in Massachusetts. Um, and, no, not, not that that makes any difference. Um, Anne has been a teacher and a writer. Uh, she has a, a BA in liberal arts. She has a master's in education and a master's in special education. Um, and her previous book was Five Courageous Mothers Who Raised Children with Down Syndrome. That was published in 2017. And the book that we are going to discuss tonight, uh, again, across the spectrum, Mothers of Autistic Children Speak, uh, was published um, in September of 2021. Um, I will let you know where you can obtain a copy of the book later. Um, and uh, with that said, I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Anne and let her start the program. Thank you. Thank you, Alan um, and Danielle for being here. I'm thrilled to be in Maywood for the night. Uh, I know that you have reached out to not only the Maywood Library patrons, but other school systems in the area, and I so appreciate that. Why? Because I am thrilled to introduce people to my second book, Across the Spectrum, as Alan said, Mothers of Autistic Children Speak. But here I am in my square, and you probably wonder, who is she? How is she sitting there writing this book? So here's how I thought I'd break it down. <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about me, how it came to be that I did write these books. And then I'm gonna tell you about one of the mothers in this second book. Um, and so, lastly, I'm going to um, have Danielle speak about two things. One is raising her two children on the spectrum and why she wanted to participate in um, this book. So I'll begin. Um, as Alan said, I was a teacher of special needs for almost 20 years through the North River Collaborative in Rockland, Massachusetts. And I was hired to um, create and run a school to work program for adolescents. So students came to me when they were 16 and they left when they were 22. So I got to know them pretty darn well. And happily, I got to know their parents. In fact, it was one of the mothers um, early on in my career who, uh, one of my jobs, I should start to say, is that um, was to not only get these students ready for the big wide world, but to also help their parents transition to what they call adult services. And that has a scary overtone because it is state services. So I would take parents to see various places where I thought their son or daughter would succeed after school. And on one of these ordinary days, ordinary car ride, I heard an extraordinary story. The backstory of one of my students, Edward, told by Hazel. By the time we got to this workplace, I had, my jaw had dropped and I vowed I would write that story. It was years later that I even started, but her story, Hazel's, is that she gave birth to Edward back in the 70s, and her obstetrician told her right then and there, you leave Edward right here, we'll find an institution for him. You go on home. I've delivered your other two children. You have a full life. Edward will not make your life better. Hazel did the unthinkable and took Edward home. So this mother, as well as the four other mothers in this story are really 
the forerunners to the services that are now available on the South Shore of Boston for people with special needs. It was, they all showed such love and tenacity. It's, it's, un, it's shattering. I still get goosebumps when I read from that book. So that book came out and the publisher asked me if I would think about writing a book about mothers raising children with autism. And I thought back to my classrooms and in the days when I was teaching, the students came to me with a diagnosis. It was in their paperwork. And yet, in the, so that was the 80s and the 90s. By mid 90s, those terms, those labels were being subsumed by that new big umbrella term called autism. <clears throat> so I thought back to certain families that I had gotten close to and, and friends and families who were raising that I knew raising a child or children on the spectrum. One in particular was a colleague by the name of Millie. And over those 20 years of teaching, I would run into Millie at the main headquarters of our school, being a collaborative, we were in many schools in the area, um, school buildings, but our headquarters was one central school. When I ran into Millie over these years, she would tell me a Bobby story, we call them. And Bobby stories, I feel as though I grew up with Bobby, yet I did not really know what was going on behind her closed doors for uh, these stories to happen. So knowing that she's private and quiet, I wasn't sure whether she'd want to be part of this book, but I thought I'm not going to know whether I can do the book if, if I don't try. And Millie's answer immediately was, of course I'll do it, Anne. Maybe it will help somebody. And that was the genesis of the first book, but it's also every other mother's answer when I asked if they'd like to do it. You can tell where this is going, mm -hmm. right? So these stories is a compilation of five, six different stories um, starting in the 70s and up to current day. So it covers 50 years of families raising people with autism. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about Millie's story only because it highlights some of those kind of quirky characteristics that, uh, that people have walked away saying that, that those characteristics, I am sure, are the definition of autism. But what those don't tell you is Bobby's other behaviors, as all these stories, other behaviors, their skills, how the families respond, what kind of parameters are put up by parents in the household to manage a household with other children. So I hope that that gives you some kind of context to understand why it is that I'm sitting in this square. Um, but again, not only were the parents the ones who wanted to come forward, it was their, their lives that emboldened me and gave me the passion to keep writing. So I hope that we have some other people coming on, but I'm gonna read a little bit from Millie's story because I think it introduces us back to those characteristics in a very quick amount of time. And <clears throat> hopefully it will help people to think of questions um, because I think through discussion, it's the best way we can all understand autism a little bit better. So, I'll begin. Pull up a nice warm blanket. Get out a cup of tea. This is from Millie and Bobby, who has classic autism. Bobby was different from my other children. He was my fourth, born in February 1978. It was when Bobby turned two that I noticed the waves. Each of his siblings reached their developmental milestones on schedule, but not Bobby. He didn't walk, so he was 17 months, and he was not potty trained until the age of four. Those lags were problematic, but he had other unusual traits for his age. As a toddler, part of his daily routine was to climb up onto the couch of a telephone book. There he'd study those pages quietly for hours. 
By the age of two, he loved reading the numbers lit up on digital clock. And soon he was rattling off digits as though they were his own private language. But he had no words. He spoke only numbers. We speculated, hmm, but thought maybe he's unusually gifted. There were other peculiarities. Bobby rarely made eye contact and had a distant blank stare. He also showed no curiosity for the world around him. And in our family of five, he was a loner, preferring to play by himself. Strange too was his rigid adherence to routine. When he left his bedroom each morning, he carried a bucket of blocks, Lincoln logs and matchbook cars. He plopped himself down and began constructing a maze. The maze was so grand, it took over our entire living room. He took a break for lunch, but then went right back to it. And at that time each day, he dismantled it completely. Out he marched again after his nap, ready to start all over again. And this routine went on every day for years. When the last block was in place, he'd come into the kitchen, open the silverware drawer and take out all the teaspoons with great purpose. He would tuck them into his maze. Then he'd place his small plastic Texaco sign in its spot, baffling until one day we figured it out. Bobby was replicating the main street in Rockland, complete with McDonald's, the train tracks, and of course, the Texas gas station, Texaco gas station. So why Bobby didn't convey curiosity about the world around him, he was observant. And the last paragraph, which again, pulls one of these characteristics out, he was also in charge. Bobby was so engrossed in this project then nobody could bother him, not at all. If by chance you did disturb him, a tantrum ensued. His silence was deafening, his concentration extraordinary. Bobby suffered these fits often, sometimes for reasons unknown. At those times, I tried cradling him and speaking gently. Most times, however, I'd have to let him carry on and wear himself out. Often he'd end up on climbing onto the couch and falling asleep. Bobby's peculiarities were complicated. His stormy rants were troubling, but it was his lack of language that was such a barrier. <clears throat> Having a fit as a toddler, I could rock him on my lap to soothe him. Later, when they occurred, he'd rest his head on my shoulder, awaiting my caress. The tumultuous day, became as peaceful as a lullaby. But one day, without warning, all fondling ended. Nobody, not even me, can touch him anymore. Not at all, not even a little. It continues to this day, 30 years later. He'll hug me if my arms are at my side, but I cannot hug him back. I have come close to begging. Someone told me, that touching hurts certain people with autism. It feels like a sunburn, they explain. But why? Why so suddenly did this come about? I don't know. I used to hold his hand all the time and he held mine. I miss those days. So those characteristics, those unusual traits, those quirks, whatever you talk, you want to use as the adjective, the eye contact, the blank stare, the developmental milestones he missed, the no curiosity that it appears to be, the adherence to routine. These are all those things that many of us, thank goodness, understand is part of autism, but it's this much of autism. And it also shows itself in very different ways in very different families. So what's happened with Millie, um, I mean, with Bobby through Millie, Bobby's now 41 years old. The story in here goes that by the age of 40, Millie had realized that her health was declining and she needed to find a group home of some kind for, for Bobby. He would always meet there. To think of her doing that for herself, it was as unthinkable as Hazel taking her own son home. 
she couldn't imagine people would care for him as well as she did. And it was a heartbreak. So what she did in all sorts of situations was she pre-planned with him. And again, these are strategies, one strategy that Millie developed. There's other strategies here that other parents developed. She would talk to him about every single place they were going to go so that he had a preview and he'd understand what was gonna happen next. Same thing happened with this group home. It was inch by inch by inch. Again, the parents couldn't um, believe that he was really gonna move out. <clears throat> we decided to see, first of all, how Bobby would fare, even just being away from us, she says. We signed him up for a weekend of respite care and dropped him off on a Friday evening. Back home, we waited. No calls that night, but sure enough, the phone rang very early the next morning. The staff told me that they had reserved special seating for a morning movie. They tried knocking several times on Bobby's bedroom door. He was awake, but refused to come out shouting, I don't get up till nine o'clock on Saturdays. I often think Bobby's brain is like a computer. computer. It's programmed. He adjusted to respite care. He walked into his group home. And yet when he left that house that day, he did not have a temper tantrum, even though Bobby's life was filled with temper tantrums to the point where from age nine, he started on behavior charts. At first they had to be checked off every 10 minutes. Then they could be checked off every half hour finally every hour, but for 30 years, those behavior charts sat on Millie's kitchen counter. So moving day neared and he, she reviewed the plan with Bobby, how it was gonna work. And on January 9th, for the last time, Bobby stepped out of our house into the unknown. I watched from the front door as he and his father walked away. Suddenly he turned around to face me. Are you sure I have to go? He hesitated for a moment and went on. I thought I could talk you out of it, but I guess not. I swallowed my tears. Bobby could not see our two hearts breaking. The three of us had an unhurried drive over and without any to do, Bobby opened the door to his new home and sat calmly on the living room couch while I unpacked the rest of his things. My husband, had to step outside to hide the tears. <clears throat> when Bobby's come home, he is often, he is often um, full of new ideas now that he's with other adults. In fact, he said to his parents, I drink coffee now. And so her, his father took him to Dunkin' Donuts on the way home from his group home. And he went in and his dad said, order your coffee. He walked up to the counter and he said to the woman behind, I'd like a cup of black coffee. I'd like a cup of coffee. Oh, and she said, how do you want it? And he said, in a cup. <laughs> this is Bobby. Bobby's stories is of a full human being. He is a great worker at what he does, despite noise, despite things that wouldn't, might not have seemed like something he could handle. As he's matured, so have his parents. They now say, <clears throat> the Jimmy and I love to talk about Bobby, but not many people wanna hear it. I don't think they understand how fascinating he is and how interesting life has been with him. Perhaps they believe that there's not much going on with somebody who has autism. A pediatrician early on told me that Bobby would never love and he'd be most likely institutionalized. Since he's been born, Bobby has made me laugh every day, several times a day. Even with all the stress and the years of negative behavior, I have laughed. And despite the hard work, he's brought us such joy. Our lives would be incomplete without him. That's a summary of Millie's story. Other stories, again, talk about the possibilities of things on the spectrum. There's a story of 
people who were diagnosed with it uh, with the label fragile X. Dawn is the mother of Sean and Jenna. They're siblings, and Sean was the youngest to be labeled autistic. But this is a story of how different family members with the same diagnosis can be so different. Both are now in their 40s, but only one is employable. Why? Then there's a story of Asperger's. Asperger's has created in this son's life a story of bullying. And yet he went on to complete graduate school. He's a math tutor right now, plays in bands, he's married, and he has a son. What is Asperger's? And how do people cope with it? Then there's a story of Kelly who raised Meriwether, who up until high school, life sailed along for Meriwether and her family, but things got out of control in ninth grade. She tried to keep a lid on Mary's defiant and disruptive behaviors. As professionals in all her schools, four and four years reported that she's sheer trouble. To curtail what is thought to be simple adolescent obstinance, Kelly sent Mary Weather to Utah on one of those two week outward bound adventures, hoping that they'd help change her daughter. Within 24 hours, Kelly was called by the program psychologist to report, Mary's not a behavior problem, she's autistic. So what are the differences between diagnosing a girl with autism and boys? And how at age 18 is she going to put her life back together? Why does it go so undetected for so long? And before we introduce Danielle, the, the other story is about um, a mother who, with her husband, decided they were going to have a perfect baby. And the husband went out and bought that book, How to Have a Perfect Baby. It suggested that they uh, play music to the fetus in utero. She did it twice a day for her entire pregnancy. Patrick was born but he would not speak. And he was forever, like Bobby, playing in isolation, counting numbers and watching Disney movies. His pediatri her pediatrician said he'd never speak, but he finally uttered, he really sang his first word, pig. What happened to Patrick today? What are, what are his achievements? You'd be surprised. And then we have Danielle, who's here tonight to talk about her life with Johnny and Bella. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Um, so when Anne asked me to kind of do these Zooms, she, she wanted me to focus on why I wanted to tell our story. And I always say, it's not my story. It's, it's John and Bella's, it's their story. And what their mission in life is. And, and that drove me to what my mission in life was. Um, Isabella and John both had a normal pregnancy, normal delivery, not, not too many abnormal, abnormalities. And then um, with John, he was a little later speaker. He was, you know, a little later walker, but nothing too scary, nothing too, out there that they're like, you need to go get this checked out. So he was in early intervention and he did amazing and he had supports in place and he just did so well. And while he was doing well, we noticed a real change in Isabella. Um, she was not making milestones. She was not speaking. She was not um, giving eye contact. And unfortunately during that time, we, we um, experienced some trauma. So we were present at the Boston Marathon and a lot of what we thought was going on might have been anxiety and PTSD from that experience. And it was just really difficult to figure out if it was that or if it was something else. Um, Bella was diagnosed a year to the day of the anniversary of the Boston Marathon. Um, level three autism, nonverbal um, level three autism. 
And it was okay. It was okay because now that we had this diagnosis, we knew it was, it was full throttle. Can we get her the help she needs? We need to you know, do this. We need to see a specialist. We need to do that. I grew up around many people with disabilities. I grew up, my family all worked in the field. So it was something I was very comfortable with. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise to me. Um, so as Bella got her personality and her um, specialist involved, you know, she, she, she was doing well. Um, kindergarten became very difficult for John. Um, he retreated a lot. He ran away. He had a spike in behaviors. It just, he just wasn't comfortable. He was not, he didn't feel safe. He was not, oh, John, John wants to say hi. Mom, who ran away? Say hi. Hi. We're talking about the hi, book. Hi, John. The book? Yeah. I don't get, remember the story that we wrote about, about, about our life? Yeah. Yeah, that we're talking about it. Wait, do I run away in the book? When you were very small, when you were in kindergarten, you ran away. How come? I, I don't think you were happy. Was I? You're happy now though, right? Yeah, of course yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kindergarten. Kindergarten was really tough. Um, and we realized that he needed to go through the same process that we, we went through with Bella. And, you know, again, a year later, he was diagnosed. He was diagnosed um, level one and ADHD. So now, you know, the thing about these, this book is very interesting is that my kids were the youngest um, to see how different the diagnosing goes and how different um, specialties were and how different therapies were back when Millie and, and even, and even when Meriwether was, was diagnosed, you know, it's so, it's so different. It's just such a different, when we were, we first got a diagnosis, they didn't do levels. They didn't, they didn't talk about that stuff. Now it's levels of support needed. And, um, which I agree with to a point, I feel like, I feel like, yes, John is a level one autism, but he doesn't, he doesn't, he might not need a substantial support like somebody else that has level one. But um, we got both the diagnosis, we hit therapies head on, head on, and we, you know, hit school head on. We did not have a great experience with school. Um, it was very difficult advocating for things. What did I not see? <laughs> what did I not do good with? You did good with everything, John. It was school supporting you was a little difficult. Did you let her talk? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> I feel like the schools were still learning how to support those students. I feel like they're still learning today how to support those students. Unfortunately, they were not able to support Bella in the public school system. And she is in a therapeutic setting at this point. And it was the best decision we've ever made. Um, while I, I, it, it's sad that she has to go 40 minutes away from home to a therapeutic environment. And she doesn't have the inclusion that you know, a public school student would, it's where she needs to be. And she's, and she's done amazing things as, since she's been there. Um, John is slowly going into a full inclusion model into the general education um, setting, which has been amazing. He's worked so hard to get to where he is today. And I'm super proud of him. I, I think I, every day he impresses me. I, I tell a story in the book that he's my future mayor. He's going to be a politician. I, I already know it. Um, <laughs> and he, he's very intelligent. He speaks as an old soul. He speaks yeah. as a, as an adult. He doesn't speak as a 12 year old, um, yeah. which can get him in trouble every once in a while, ah. but um, it's him. That's his personality. And it's, and it's great to see it's, he loves telling stories. He loves, you know, making videos. He's very imaginative. He's just, he's just a great kid. And during COVID was really difficult um, for both, both of the kids. You know, he wanted to be in school with his friends. He didn't want to be home with mom. That's not fun. Um, and Bella just couldn't, she just couldn't do remote learning. It just was not, it was just not in the cards for her. And, and, you know, she regressed a lot. Um, 
but we're getting back there. We're getting to a point where the year away from school is forgot about and um, hopefully knock on wood, we never have to go back there again. <laughs> um, and, and he, and John did amazing things while we were home too. He, he, they didn't, they didn't have really a great connection yet. And I feel like that time at home, the only plus to that was they made a great connection and he, re she realized that John is someone she can rely on to be there when she might be having a difficult time or she might need to um, escape or she, she might need help. You know, I feel like that was the, that was the only positive to COVID was that clicked for them that this is my sibling and I'm going to be with them forever. You know, this is when mom and dad are not here, they're going to be together. You know, I, I feel like that was the plus to COVID. And how about the Temple Grandin story? Oh, he did. He did. I, I haven't, we haven't caught up in either. Um, he did a book report last year on Temple Grandin and got up in front of his entire class and talked about her. We, we read several books about her and he read them live during, during COVID. And um, he did a book report and he explained autism to his entire class. And I was just recently going through some of his schoolwork and it was like an all about me and, you know, what's different about me um, paper. And it said, I, you know, I have autism and, and he's, he's, he's okay with saying that, you know, and he should be, he should be, that, that is part of his life. He, he should be able to discuss it. And I think he's going to be one of those self-advocates that gets up and says, I have autism and it doesn't matter. It doesn't stop me. It's, 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 I'm going to do whatever I want and I'm going to, and I'm going to succeed whether that diagnosis is on me or not. And, and I think he also has Bella's back because he will take care of her. Definitely. Yes, definitely. I definitely think he will, he will definitely take care of her <laughs> or vice versa. She might take care of him. Yeah. <laughs> Physically, she might take care of him. And what was your, you said earlier, um, Danielle, about wanting to uh, be part of this book. You want to talk a little bit about that? So I didn't want someone to feel the way I felt. I felt very, it, getting in the initial diagnosis is so overwhelming. Then having two, then having siblings that have a, a diagnosis is just over the top. But when I began this journey, or when we began this journey, I, I didn't feel like I had anybody. I didn't feel like my school, our school system, like I said, was, was not giving the right supports. And I felt like nobody really understood that until they actually went through it themselves. And I didn't want somebody else to feel like I did during that. And I thought that was a big part of why I told the story because you're not alone. As, as, as much as all of our stories are different, we took the same path to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, we, we, we all have different aspects of autism and, and what works and what doesn't. And <laughs> Bella wants to swing now. Um, but we all need to be together. We all need to do this together because we just need that. We just need that support. Those women, the women that you introduced us to and will be forever my friends. You know, they're, they're people that I will respect and I will reach out to at every aspect of my life because they've all been through it before I have. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, Patrick's mom, I talk to her weekly. You know, she's somebody that I can rely on for advice. Mm -hmm. Millie and Mary Weather's mom are just they're just amazing people. Every person yeah. that was there is just amazing. And again, we all chose different ways to get where we were going. Yeah. Yeah. But it's important for us to all hear each other's stories too. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is through stories and that we can feel so less alone. So I so thank you, Danielle, for uh, coming forward because not easy. And you know, there all the time um, sharing your story over Zoom <laughs> and uh, it, and it's come together. So thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> do people have a summary of what the rest of the book is um, about? 
Again, it, it covers quite a bit of time for time's sake, but also as Danielle pointed out, what's happened and many steps that have taken place to improve people's, um, in especially schools have come to, to a certain extent, they've come, they've far better than even when I was there, um, but we have a long way to go. And the, one of the um, spokespeople for autism is my favorite guy um, who talks about autism this way. He says, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So this is an invitation to think a little bit about someone who might have those characteristics that we've talked about um, that are those quirky things that put us off and just realize that there's there's a person there and what they might want is just for you to sit down and be with them, wait till they speak. I think it will help all of us because we've come to a certain level of understanding autism, but we to bring it to the next level, which is acceptance is a whole different. It takes yeah. cultural changes to, to have this happen. LGBT, it took years for that to happen. Uh, alcoholism, same thing. We're on our way. Let's continue. So Alan, thank you again for well, having us. Thank today. you. And maybe uh, we were joined along the way. And um, I have a couple of questions if uh, either you or Danielle don't mind answering them. Um, I found it interesting that uh, Danielle brought up or you, you guys brought up Temple Grandin. Um, um, from speaking with other people, um, and again, I, I, I have a lot of friends who are into movies and stuff, and the first time they think of somebody with autism, they think of Dustin Hoffman and Rain Man. And generalize it as that, but if you, you compare his character with a real person, Temple Grandin, you can see the differences so much. And again, the spectrum is so large that um, it's enormous. You can't think of it all. But this is a, sort of an aside question, but Temple Grandin was brought out when the, the, the film came out, the movie came out, that people were more, brought more aware. Um, and I take it that you think that hopefully is a good thing. Are there other movies people could watch that might give them a better awareness of autism and the different types that if you can think of any. I mean, I, can, I, I remember one from a long time ago. Uh, it was called The Boy Who Could Fly back from the 80s. But I, it, film reaches so many people that uh, I think it's, 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 it's a way of making people more aware of, of that. And I don't know if you've ever seen anything or, 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 or heard of anything that might do that kind of help for, for people with autism and make people more aware of it. That's a great question, Ellen. I, um, <clears throat> Danielle, do you want to respond first? I do, I do, because this is, this is a great question and I have a very difficult time with, with this um, particular subject. I, the, the, the thing with TV and film is it depicts one type of autism. And unfortunately, the negative to that is when someone sees Bella out and she has a meltdown, they don't think of autism, they think bad kid which is another reason why I told my story or Bella's story was because we need to normalize severe autism. We need to normalize that it is not just about, and as much as I highly respect her, Temple Grandin, Stephen Shore, those type of people, not every autistic has a special power. Not every autistic is gonna have savant-like behaviors. It's not all easy either. It's not, it's, it, it, and I feel like a lot of films and TV shows depict one type of it. And it's, it, it makes it more difficult for families like us 
when we go to the movies or when we go somewhere because we're not showing the whole spectrum we're showing one tiny tiny bit to it and yeah. i love temple and and and, and stephen shore and and highly respect them it just we need to find a way where that severe autism also gets pushed out there and we need to find a way that our communities accept and include those with with severe autism as well and, and you know my my child's not a bad child my my child does not have a temper tantrum she can't she has sensory overload so bad that walking into a walmart is difficult for her and you know what that's okay that's okay because you know what i'm gonna deal with it you're just gonna keep on going on i would love for that to be shown in a film um and hopefully someday and, and we're in 2021 hopefully 2022 maybe that's not a hard ask but I, I, my, my personal feelings, I don't feel a, a film has depict autism yet. I, th I, I think they've, they've done the Hollywood, Hollywood version, okay. not the true version. It's an excellent question. And I, I'm so glad, Danielle, you're on tonight with me because um, your point is so well taken. Um, and even though you're saying that that you know Bella might have a tantrum and people don't see that in movies. Um, it's true in Millie's life, in, in everybody's life here who has had a child with autism and it's not seen. And what's most disturbing is that even with my students, when they'd have a meltdown in a store, we were working, customers came to me as though, why are you letting this go on? People, it's again, it's another level of acceptance. So we need to keep opening the door to show the whole picture um, because the tantrum isn't that she's hungry or maybe she is, but that's usually not it. It's what Danielle said, there's some overload and people don't get that. And that's a huge, thank you, Danielle, a huge piece to understand more what's typical in all people with autism. The same reason Bobby can't be hugged. The same reason why tastes are funny. So it's a very important piece to this discussion. Thank you for the question, but Danielle, you, once again, you nailed it. Um, and, and Danielle spoke, I think, you know, over the years with the services that are available, with the people that are available, um, you know, if, if you have a medical condition such as heart disease or, you know, God forbid someone gets diagnosed with cancer, there are straightforward tests that can be done. You know, you, you, you go in to get a medical test and they tell you. With autism, it seems that it is a long drawn out process. And since there are so many different facets of autism, how, does, how do parents go about getting, you know, finding out if their child is autistic. Are there warning signs to look for? Are there certain uh, clinicians that they can go to? You know, is there an answer there? Great question again, Alan. Do you want to take this, Danielle? Sure. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really different with everybody because sometimes those very that are very aware or, or, you know, pick up on something, it could be school and school could make the, the recommendation that your child be evaluated or the pediatrician sometimes picks up on it, but there is um, Boston, Massachusetts has a very, very great autism coverage. So, and they have great specialists here um, in Massachusetts. So there's plenty of clinics and specialists that that people see to receive a diagnosis, but again, it can be very, very different. It can be diagnosed from, an, from a psychologist. It can be diagnosed by a neurologist. Um, and again, like you said, it's not 100% proof. There's no exact blood test that they can do to say it's, it, so it's, you know, a lot of people are misdiagnosed uh, and, you know, they're diagnosed young as on, on the spectrum. And then as they get supports in place, 
they realized it was, you know, high functioning ADHD. So it's, it's, it, there's no hundred percent proof that what they're doing is, is right on the nail that they're being diagnosed there. You know, there's the, there's tests that they can do for cognition and, and that, but honestly, it can be different with every, every child. An OT could see something sensory wise and say, Hey, we think something's going on, diagnose it as autism. And it could be sensory processing disorder. So it's, it's, it, it's very difficult. And sometimes you're, it's, it's um, another part of this book emphasizes the, the two things. One is there's often misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. Often it's you know, hyperactivity <clears throat> that comes first and behavior issues, as I mentioned with um, Kelly, but um, not only neurologists, but usually each person in here in this book talks about how they found their way. And thank goodness, from the time Millie's son was born to Danielle's, there is early intervention where there's lots of eyes on. And as a team that works with these individuals, they can spot things. And the last thing I just want to say is the only test that can be done is for Fragile X. There is a gene <clears throat> that is able to be discovered, has been discovered. Um, <clears throat> so far, it's the only gene correlated with autism. Okay. Um, I have one final question. And if anybody else is here who wants to pipe in, please do. Um, we've spoke about um, Bella and Bobby. But what advice do you have for the parents? The parents are going, I mean, they have a very, very busy life um, with their children. And what advice would you have for parents with children who have autism? Right. My first advice is take a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> Take a deep breath. It's gonna be okay. Things are gonna be okay. It's it. It's it's a lot. It's a lot to take on. But like you said, it's there's a lot a, a lot of people that can help you too. I always give the advice to reach out to your local CPAC, which is the Special Education oh Parent God. Advisory Council. You every in Massachusetts, it's required to have one for each school district. Um, those are your parents that have been through this. Those are the parents that you will connect with somebody that has been through something and your family support centers. So here in Massachusetts, we um, have a family support center for each region and they support um, those with disabilities and they do you know, recreational activities. They have support groups. You're gonna find again. You're gonna find someone that's been through exactly what you've been through. Talking to parents is the best connection you'll ever get. As much as you know, the 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 physicians and the specialists are amazing. Talking to another parent that's been through it is is life changing. Um, there was a support agency that I got involved with um, that was completely life changing. I met parents that had been in this and this and, and talking with Anne and, and meeting those parents just it's you're not alone you're not alone you know the if 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 I walk away tonight the best advice I can give take a deep breath you're not alone and connect with another parent anything to add Anne I think <clears throat> I'm losing my voice a little uh, yeah bit. I think Danielle has um, masterfully communicated what I would have too. All right, let me just pop one thing up here. Uh, for those of you who are here, this again, this is a picture of Anne, and this is the book that was that she wrote uh, in speaking with the mothers. It's called Across the Spectrum: Mothers of Autistic Children Speak. It is available on Amazon and through Omni Publishing. So if you uh, do a search on either one, you should come up with the book. I'm very glad I have read it. Um, and uh, it's wor well worthwhile uh, if you buy the book and you read it 
either to get someone else to buy it, but pass it around. It's, it's something that, at least in my feeling, um, should be known and hopefully will help things along. Um, and Danielle, any closing comments? I, I first of all, again, want to thank you, Ellen, for doing this for uh, myself as well as these moms. Um, the book is also it's it's on OmniPub, it, okay. uh, which is short for Omni Publishing. But uh, the my inside, what I would love to see, the mothers would of course love to see this book in other mothers' hands. I would also love to see this book um, in the hands of family members, grandparents, aunts, cousins, so that they can understand the dynamics in the household they go to visit. So important. These mothers need support. Can start with the family. But my, my real hope is that this book finds its way into teachers' hands because of how it changed my life. When I learned Hazel's story, when I finally understood the whole backstory to Millie's fun stories, these, what happened to me is I, I changed the way I taught. And I, I see the people as bigger than what I saw them as before, more important than what they were. So anybody going through graduate school, any psych, uh, person that's teaching, it just, you always think you know everything. And I did too. But these are the stories that open your heart a little bit more to look in social workers, I even say your hairdressers. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Danielle, thank you uh, for being here tonight and telling your story. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad that we hooked up together and uh, were able to do this. As I mentioned to you, I am recording this. I will get you the link and you can share it with Danielle if you'd like. Uh, once we get that up on our website, and I'm hoping to uh, uh, get the book actually into our library collection, too. I don't see how that could hurt. Um, and I will uh, speak of it with other people that I talk to, and I will hopefully take the recording tonight and hand it off to other libraries so they can use it also, if that's okay. Terrific. All right. That's, well, that's the way it moves. With that, I, I thank you again for your time. I wish you well. I wish you a healthy and happy new year. And uh, uh, may, I'm hopefully down the road, we'll talk again. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.